And we're live and welcome everybody to this remote interview. My name is Lisette and I'm interviewing people and companies doing great things remotely. And man, have I got a surprise for you guys. Today on the line, I have Pilar Orti and Maya Middlemas. You guys know both of them probably from the past. I uh, was a guest on Pilar's show, the 21st Century Work Life Podcast for Ages. I've worked with them both at Happy Melly One or Management 3.0 as colleagues. And now Pilar and Maya have written a book together. And the book is called Thinking Remote inspiration for leaders of distributed teams. So we're not going to start with what your virtual office looks like because people will have to listen to Pilar's interview way back in the beginning <laughs> to hear about that. <laughs> and also, uh, what I really want to know is, why did you write this book? Your competition to my book. No, I'm kidding. I'm no, kidding. we're not. <laughs> <laughs> totally joking. Totally different, uh, <laughs> totally different styles and, uh, and formats and everything. So, yeah. but it is a great, it is a great book. Lots of really good things in there. So let's start with the why you wrote it. Why did we write the book, Pilar? <laughs> <laughs> well, because we had lots of blog posts. That is we why we put the book together. So yeah. we've got lots of content on our blog. However, people who buy books sometimes I'm not looking for blog posts and there are some people who prefer to read a book rather than to go online and have a look at blog posts. Hmm. So the reason for putting it together and giving it some sense of whole also was to look for a, well, look to look for, for, I will say a new audience, new readership to put our stuff out there on a different platform. Yeah. So, um, and also to say, this is what we are about. And also the format of it. This is the format we're about, which is some long, long form stuff where dip, you can dip in and out. It covers lots of different topics. Um, and yeah, so that, that was the reason. Anything else, Maya, that was behind you saying, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think I agree with what you said about it being, this is what we're about. And I think the process of actually compiling it and curating our existing material really helped us think through that and and draw out the themes because a lot of those it was written from mostly from existing blog posts that we put together in a new way but whilst we whilst we do have some kind of strategy with the blog we don't tend to go through and think you know we're going to have a specific amount of, of content or posts per year about x or y and actually reviewing it all made us really realize what we were about where what our strengths lay in and where we were getting the the best feedback from the people who are interacting it and those are the things that we want to do more of where we feel we can best add value so that's what made sense to pull together as Pilar said into a format that people can own in one place can reference can flick through that's indexed and they can dip in and out of and find those little chunks of inspiration when they need them to solve an immediate problem so we did write some extra we did write there was one extra blog post so an extra yeah. chapter that went in when we looked actually <gasps> we haven't covered that yeah. um and also maya wrote some leadership reflection questions that went at the end of each article which are not on the web so so it is a complete um complete uh, object a complete work of art on its own yeah, I can imagine it's really handy because as I go to my website sometimes to search for different topics, it's true. They're scattered throughout 240 something blog posts and only I really remember like, oh yeah, I did this one like four years ago on this thing. So yeah, putting all the essential stuff in one place in one well-organized place where people, and like you said, flip through, you can index it like, oh yeah, what have they got on team building and all, yeah, all that stuff. So it's called Inspiration for Leaders of Distributed Teams. So I'm assuming it's written for leaders of distributed teams. Why did you pick leaders? Why focus on the management? That's oh. who we focus on. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we do. It's, go on, Maya. We're really all about change. So I think we were trying, I think we were interpreting the idea of, of leadership quite broadly, as in people who are change makers within their teams or organizations and the idea that anyone can be inspirational and anyone can make things happen um, but obviously the book is about changes so hopefully it's the people it's going to inspire most of those who are in a in a position either professionally through their role authority or just because of the effect that they have on other people that they can say to others let's do let's try this let's put this into practice and see if it improves things or this is the practice we want to move towards so leaders yes but the aspirational leaders as well 
Indeed, because managers and leaders are totally different things. And one of the quotes or one of the things you said that the book was in the book, you said it's a handy tool for informal learning within management teams. And I thought so too, as I read through the reflections, a lot of the book is you should be thinking about these kind of things. You know, you need to be thinking about your virtual space. You need to be thinking and then giving the pointed questions for people to really dive in and not saying how to, but more saying, keep these things in mind which I really enjoyed because uh, it's true. Every team is different. So yeah. there's no silver bullet for any team. So indeed it's a, it's exactly yeah. the point. If I can pick up on your point, uh, Lisette, about that managers and leaders are not the same thing. However, most managers are being asked to lead their teams. Mm. Uh, and uh, especially when we are in the, well, I'm going to retract on myself quite quickly. When we are in the virtual remote space, uh, we are asking managers to be, uh, less hands-on, more to provide more um, the ecosystem for the teams to be self-organized. Of course, there are. You can also do it in a different way in the online space. You can also be more hands-on and more controlling if you really want to. So, but for us, it's the fact that those people who do have that managerial role, they need to see it more as a leadership role. Um, and also then, like Maya is saying, there are actually people who might not have the official management role, but sometimes they have been tasked officially with change. Mm -hmm. So we're also asking for, we're also wanting to provide for those people. Really like it. Really like it. So what I've done is I've gone through and read the book and wrote down things from most of the chapters that I really enjoyed about that chapter. And one thing that I really liked about your book in particular was the was actually the first chapter about designing the digital workspace, because that's something that I think very few people put a lot of thought into. I hear it here and there, people talking about it, but that's not something that I hear very often. And one of the things, uh, one of the things that you guys focused on is, well, one, what can we learn from the physical space that we can transfer into the digital space? And then what needs to be different? And I really like that you are thinking about how people should feel when they're entering the the digital space. And then you've given some questions to ask when designing. Why did you include this? in the book. What was important to you guys about this? And I don't know who to ask first. I don't want to pick somebody and then have them be like, actually, Maya's the one. So I'm going to just ask into the group and I don't know, we'll raise hands or something. But Pilar wrote that section. So I think it's, she should respond on that. I will answer in that um, the whole concept of, of designing the space seems to go out of the window sometimes because we just adopt a tool. Uh, and many times we adopt that tool and we don't customize it. We don't think about whether the stuff it's asking us to do fits our own workflow, our own work process, our own team uh, identity sometimes, our own culture. So it's about being very deliberate about how we're using technology uh, and this concept of designing so that it fits, so that we construct something that's going to help us. So a lot of thought, nobody, you hear it all the time. I was having a conversation the other day in, in a bar with someone who said, yeah, I've heard of how open plan offices, you know, they're not conducive to that and that. So what we do sometimes we put a clear wall so that people can have a private conversation, but see who's across and, and, and to, to give that sense of openness, but also privacy. Those conversations rarely happen when a company or a team is adopting the digital workspace. You don't have those conversations, and yet you would never dream of going into an office and not thinking about how, how and why you're going to design it. Mm -hmm. So it's to get into that mindset. The first thing is, look, you are moving to a different environment for your team to work in. Yeah. You need to design it. Yeah. And where would you suggest people start? If you've never thought about, like, what, what kind of questions would you, would you ask them to start with just to, to go down this path? So what does your team, how does your team interact? What mm -hmm. kind of interactions? Because this is the digital workspace from the point, the point of our point of view. We help teams to collaborate, to work digitally online. And a lot of that is transferring their practices in the co-located office to something that is more office optional, to the remote space. So it all it needs to be built around interactions. If all your interactions are very um, task-based, you will need to use one kind of environment if your interactions are more about long conversations, making lots of decisions, that will require a different kind of space. So 
what kind of interactions does, does the team have? Yeah. And what kind of culture do you want to reflect? Do you want people collaborating? Do you want them competing? How visible do they need to be to one another in terms of their output and their activities? Um, what, what do people need to see to inspire them to do their best work and, and be motivated when they come into the workspace? And it's, it's funny what, what I was saying about how much thought goes into designing the physical workspace and people talk about it in the pub after and things like that. I think, I think maybe it's just a lack of awareness of what choices there really are in the digital space now. There is the choices that people have to make between different tools or different hubs, different sets of, of apps. There's so much to decide. And if you don't have some guiding principle under that, then it can all become a bit of a, an opportunic mess. And somebody likes the look of this thing and you bolt that onto the other. Whereas if you start with an idea of this is what we want to reflect about how we work with each other, then you can come from that first principle and, and see what fits with that or what doesn't, see if there's a better alternative. Yeah, indeed. Oftentimes we're sort of just thrown together and said, okay, here's the goal of the project, now go. And everybody's uh, like, uh, okay, <laughs> true. But it's always good to take a step back. I mean, there's a number of cases and a number of ways to take a step back, but I really liked this idea of designing the digital workspace for your working needs like what fits that so uh mm -hmm. yeah, kudos on uh kudos already on chapter one and there's still uh, many <laughs> chapters to go yet <laughs> so um one of the other things so that, that actually this transitions nicely is in in chapters three we've got the dangers of working out loud and I really love to be, you know, because we've talked about this before numerous times. I think we still, we even have a working out loud episode on the, on the 21st century work life podcast. And we were like, yeah, we got to make our work visible. But in this chapter, you guys asked the question, like how much info is too much info? Like how mm -hmm. loudly do we really need to be working? And, uh, and then I especially liked the question where you said, uh, we need to really think about how we, we don't want to feed the look what I've done mindset. <laughs> And that really struck me in particular because, you know, as I read on the, on the management 3.0 team, we use, I done this mm. and everybody writes down what they've done that day. And really when my list is short, I'm really sitting there like, Hmm, what else can I add? <laughs> Look like, I mean that, you know, and I'm like, wait a second. What I did was totally valid. I tracked my time. You know, I'm an honest worker and like my list was short. I just did these two big tasks today. That's the only thing I did, but it's still compared to like everybody else's list. It's like really short. So, uh, so I agree that this is a really important point to make. And so I want to just bring up the topic of working out loud and your views on visibility on remote teams and how visible do we need to be with each other? So I know this is sort of a broad question that isn't even really a question, but I would like to open up the floor to talk about working out loud because I know that this is, there is stuff here that needs to come out. So stuff. Okay. Stuff. <laughs> we do stuff. Um, I suppose really this is almost the same question as the last one because how visible you need to be and in what form depends on the work and how people are going to interact over the work. And it might well be that somebody is working on a big, sing like a single written project all week and all that they're able to be visible on is by saying, hi, I'm going to be head down in this all day or oh, please don't speak to me in fact because I'm going to be... And I remember using that I done this app um, when I was working with you, Lisette, and I was working on long research projects at the time and often getting to the end of the day thinking, what do I put? <laughs> you know, and I've done six hours of something, but it's not a list of tasks. And, and like you casting around for what to make visible. Um, so the app shouldn't drive that, that expectation. And we certainly in the teams that we've worked with and on the podcast recently, we were talking to somebody who live streams their coding on a Twitch broadcast and you can't get more visibly working out loud than that and every thought he has, he then types on the screen and to get help and people can see it in real time. Now, I couldn't imagine working that out loud. <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's a difference between out loud and surveillance, you know, yes. like we also don't want to go into surveillance state either. Yeah. And well, I think it, it's, it goes back to also what Maya was saying, it, it it goes back to why are you doing it? Mm. Why do you decide that in your team you want to, sorry, I keep banging the mic, uh, why you want to work out loud? Uh, what is the point? Is the point to share our work process? Is the point to know where we're at? Is it progress? Is it accountability? 
because they all those all require also different processes. So if it's more of a, um, uh, if it's more about accountability or progress or uh, of the work, then you want something maybe like I done this or Trello. But if it's about thinking process, then maybe you want a blog post mm. like they do in, in, in automatic and other places. Or maybe it's actually a case of working on your work in the cloud. And then you don't even have to tell anyone what you're working on because the work is there. And if someone wants to see what you're working on and where you're at, they look at that. And that is a missed, this is something that not many teams who are making the transition are ready to adopt, is truly making the work visible before it is complete. Because mm -hmm. it, it's eggy, we're not used to it. We're not used to sharing something until we're ready for feedback. Sometimes it's just good to have the stuff out there and then someone wants to know where you're at with it, they can go in. Um, it does it can create problems because if you're someone like me who makes stuff very messy until it's ready if someone goes in and sees it messy they can go oh, it's never going to be ready however that's where knowing the team comes in that is where trust that is where knowing how people work comes in so it's really hard work actually yeah yeah <laughs> And it all depends on the point of view of whoever needs to see it as well, because often all that information is there. We're all using cloud-based apps. So actually it's, it's probably perfectly possible within your suite of software to know exactly what's happening with everything at any given time. If, um, well, you'd probably be more of a manager than a leader if you spend your whole time just watching what everybody else was doing and <laughs> instead of actually leading them or doing any work yourself. But often, so it might be a case of designing specific data visualization tools or dashboards or something so that the project manager can see the state of every project or so that the finance manager can see the state of all the budgets or whatever without having to actually go and ask people to report on what they're doing just to make what's already out there visible and certainly that making that work visible shouldn't be work it shouldn't add anything i mean that i done this was a good example of something pretty frictionless that pinged you at the end of the day and just said how have you spent your time today? And it, it took 30 seconds if you were reasonably in the zone to do it. But, you know, when organizations try to implement timesheets and things like that, that people have to then try and remember what they did at the end of the day or the week sometimes. And how did I, uh, ways of making the work visible that actually create work um, are a bit of a disaster. Yeah, what I really like about what you guys are writing about is not the how to, the specific how to, but you're taking a step back and asking why. Why are you doing this? And I really enjoyed that aspect of the book. It's, uh, it's refreshing and it's important because I think in all these questions, um, we're really quick to dive in and just go. And we don't often take the step back to, to talk about these things. So I really like that. Can I um, add something? This is of course. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, so, and what's very interesting, of course, is just to see how we're continuing revisiting these principles and how we talk about them. So when we put the book together, we had this uh, chapter, like you say, the dangers of working out loud. We talk about working out loud. Since then, we've changed what we use working out loud for. And actually, what we now talk about is visible teamwork for the stuff that happens within the team. Um, because, I mean, particularly, I was thinking that working out loud seems a little bit like we're doing lots of we're being very noisy. We're maybe not listening enough. So it, it, it's a term that sometimes is difficult to grasp. So we've come back to that. But also now we can talk about working out loud when we're talking outside of our organization, outside of our team. So now you, we can have two different um, terms for making our work visible, but with a very different purpose also within the team and outside the team. And actually, I really prefer your use of the word visibility because you're right, working out loud does conjure up like, I don't know, like the stock market exchange or something <laughs> where everybody's just like yelling and screaming. That's the last place I'd want to work, yeah. you know, that kind of thing. So indeed. And, and when you talk about working out loud, you sort of have to intuitively add in without spamming people. You know, because you're working out. So I love your focus on visibility because that is the idea is how are we visible to each other? Not necessarily how are we spamming each other? And that visibility comes in all kinds of different forms. So, yeah, great. Uh, well done. Well done on that, I would say. So, okay, I guess I did every other chapter, it looks like, uh, in terms of writing notes down. But in chapter five, you talk about psychological safety on teams super important on the teams. And one thing actually that stood out for me, and it is actually something that I learned from you, Pilar, 
um, about a, a year ago, maybe two years ago. I don't know. Time flies. It could have been uh, a, lot, a lot longer ago. Um, but the idea of holding the silence. So there was one time, Pilar, that you, we were on a call together and we had, you asked a question or somebody had asked a question into the group and it was really silent. And I like jumped in and, and sort of like in this awkward pause, I sort of jumped in and, and started something else. And, and you, Pilar, were like, hold on, hold on. I think it's okay to have these awkward silences to let people think without, as a facilitator, without jumping in. And so I wanted to just open up the space a little bit to talk a little bit about psychological safety on teams and this whole idea of what you meant by holding the silence. Maya, do you want to say something about psychological safety in teams? Yeah, I think, again, this is, all these chapters are interconnected, or you're just asking the questions in a really well thought out order because this having the courage to share your work in a in an incomplete state is very much related to that idea of just feeling really safe and the people around you are going to add and support to your work rather than knock it down or look for problems with it and it's certainly something during the course of this book we went backwards and forwards over what content to include um what things to involve in the way we work together on on blog posts that sometimes become really collaborative and sometimes you need to take a bit of extra time from it step away from it let somebody else hold it for a little while and see if they're ready to contribute and so on and you can't do that unless you have an a quite intense level of safety and cooperation within that team and a, a, lot, a lot of awareness about what drives the other people and a, a great confidence of your shared goals and objectives and that there are no hidden agendas and so on and it's not some it's something that's very difficult to write a book about somebody we've got no idea what's going on in the heads or in the teams of the people who are reading it um and it's difficult for one person there could be a frustrated change agent or even a frustrated team leader who's aware that there are problems within their team and i suppose what we were trying to do was give them some vocabulary some toolkit for opening it up as something to talk about and and look at ways to make changes if changes is needed on that front. Mm-hmm. I think that the, the concept of psychological safety, of course, has become really it's it's now a well-known term in the space of people who are looking after teams, groups, etc. Um, I think I'm just going to have a look because I just want to look at what what the title <laughs> what the title of that is psychological safety in online meetings. So I think that's really important Mm -hmm. that that this particular um, chapter looks at that. So what is psychological safety in meetings? And it's the only chapter that is specifically about meetings. So that is one of the reasons why it's included in there is we wanted something about meetings. And this is the broadest, most concept-based. We need to start talking about psychological safety all the way through also. Mm-hmm. So we've got the meetings which, where we create a lot of team norms and where especially as leaders or uh, especially as hierarchical managers, uh, our behavior is going to then ripple throughout into the team. Our behavior can become a team norm very easily in meetings. So it's, it, it changes the focus of how am I going to run this effectively as to how am I going to run this safely? So that people are safe. And safe doesn't mean that we all love each other because we, we don't. I mean, sometimes if you're really lucky, you love everyone in your team, but sometimes you don't. But that's okay. All you need to do is to feel safe with them, to challenge them, to take their criticism uh, and to say and to disagree with them, especially with, with the manager. So that is really important. And of course, in an online team, that becomes even more important because as soon as we don't feel safe, we detach. And it's very easy to detach. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. so easy to detach online. I mean, you just close the laptop and stop responding to messages and yeah, you're gone. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And on, on silence, um, again, it's very interesting, the concept in meetings, it's, and in non-online meetings, all the time with a group, if you ask a question and if you hold the silence, you very likely get an answer and you very often get the answer of a very quiet person. Because you're opening it up and, and you're actually, and you're also saying, look, it's okay not to have anything to say. We're just going to wait. If nothing has, no one has anyone to say, we move on. But here's the space. 
Uh, and often when we are running, um, when we're leading a meeting or if we're running a workshop, for example, we have that thing that we've got to be going, we have to be going, <laughs> you know, it's all about moving forwards. And actually there's moments that if you can hold the silence as a group also, it's a bit uncomfortable, but also it says, you know what, it's okay just to stop, mm. okay to listen. And if you can then take that into how you work together a little bit, uh, a little bit more holistically, that can be quite interesting. Um, I'm going to go very quickly that the concept of silence in the online space is very interesting because asynchronously, silence has a very different connotation <laughs> in the asynchronous space when you're having conversations and you hear nothing back. <laughs> Or you get a drive-by, somebody like says hello, and then you say hello back, and then they don't respond. <laughs> yes. That's or also throw, super strange. Uh, yeah. Or you throw out a, a, an idea, and you get nothing. So silence in meetings is very powerful, but silence in asynchronous commun team communication needs to be clarified. Hmm. Really good point. Really good point. More to look into. <laughs> more, to, more to look into, indeed. Indeed. Okay, so on to, uh, I, I don't want to just blaze through all the chapters, but we're going to run out of time if I, don't, uh, if I don't pay attention to it. And there's some really good things here. Um, let me see. Ah, so I, can't, I think, I don't remember what chapter I had. I think it's chapter nine, but it's, it, there's a quote here that I really liked. It said, to show frustration, first you need to show that you care. So I think this is the, the chapter, Pilar, where the woman said to you, I am really frustrated with you. And, and may, I think this maybe is part of the psychological safety chapter. I'm not really sure. I can't, I, uh, sorry, my notes are a bit uh, more disorganized than I expected <laughs> somehow. But uh, it says, oh, one of the things that I took away from this. So one of the things is in order to show frustration, one, it has to be a psychologically safe environment. And... Uh, we need to be able to, to show that it comes from a place of caring. Like it's okay to tell somebody you're really frustrated when they know that you truly care about mm -hmm. them, right? Because that's, that's a different way of just, uh, I'm frustrated with you and I don't really care. And one of the quotes that I really liked was, in order to build that kind of relationship, we need to work at it. Mm -hmm. And it sounds really simple to say that, but I personally, in particular, have a very difficult time maintaining relationships as it is. It sounds probably strange because it's I'm like really public and blah, you know, it's all cheery on the podcast. But I do have a really difficult time keeping up with people. And I've tried to come up with systems. In fact, like I have a, a stack of note cards with all the names of my friends on it. Every day I pick a new card and that's the person I pay attention to. I do something for them that day in an effort because maintaining relationships is work. I mean, it, not maybe not work, but it is effort. And I think that that is a point that we miss a lot on teams is we need to actually put the effort in. So even when you say, Pilar, that we don't love each other, uh, that's often on teams. We don't love everybody that we work with. Sometimes it's a professional relationship and it's totally okay. Sometimes there's people I've worked with that I don't like at all, but we still have a fine professional relationship. But still building that relationship mm -hmm. is work or is effort. And that's something that gets really, for, I really enjoyed, uh, it sounded like a really simple tip, but I really enjoyed that reminder that it does take effort. So I guess I'm not going to ask a question. I'm going to just leave an awkward silence to see if you have anything to say about that. I suppose I'll just say I really like that idea of, of what you just explained that you did of actually making it something systematic to check in with people. As, as part of your team and that you have a tool and a, a system for doing that. Um, no because card. <laughs> whatever works for you. Um, and I think it's something that we could be a little bit embarrassed about talking about because we think that people with the greatest social skills somehow have that all in their heads at all times and they're just constantly um, giving their emotions to other people and it's all completely top of their mind the whole time. But actually most of us have quite busy minds and it doesn't mean we don't care about people, but we have to actually allocate some attention and resources to that building of relationships and maintaining them. Not when there's a problem, but in a way, without sounding really cynical about it, to build capital against when there are issues with the work and so on. And when you do have to tell somebody some feedback that might not be comfortable for either of you or that you can tackle a problem together because you've built that relationship and invested in it over the long term. 
Yeah, it's true. People that you've put time in with, they'll understand. Like I have friends back in the U.S. They like they've known me for years now, but our friendship is so solid that they know that if I don't respond for a little while, that I'll be back. It's just that I'm too overwhelmed to respond. They know that about me, and they don't hold it against me. They love me anyway, despite all my <laughs> flaws. <laughs> despite all my flaws. So, how then? Um, how then? What do you? tell leaders then to think about in terms of team building on their teams in terms of putting in the effort, what are things that people need to be thinking about in this space? One of them is what you've said is you need to have that in your schedule to make sure that you've got your connection with the individuals. And especially I'm thinking now more of management um, because if you don't do that in the online space, it will not happen. So make sure that you are building consciously those relationships with the individual. Um, and it's everything we've been talking about is having that ecosystem that allows for interactions that don't involve you. <laughs> this is where it gets really tricky is that uh, when we have great teams, teams should be able to operate without the managers or the leaders. It doesn't matter. Even you can put a team together and you maybe uh, lead the team towards a goal or you lead them through change. But actually, a team is not, a team needs to be strong enough to stand on its own. Um, and then, especially when we're making the transition as managers to the online space, we need to be pulling back, pulling back. And our role becomes more of a facilitator. Uh, and by that, I don't mean a neutral party, but I mean someone who enables other people to do stuff. Mm -hmm. But this is really difficult because um, they always say it's lonely at the top and sometimes management is a very lonely position in every time because sometimes you are the one making decisions and probably the one making unpopular decisions. And then if you add the fact that actually you need to be constructing your team communication systems and brokering relationships between your team members if they're not strong enough yet so that they can survive without you. That is really it's difficult. A huge job. It's an awful lot to ask. And I think it, it all compounds by the fact that remote communications are qualitatively different from face-to-face -face relationships. And often they can be incomplete in that we might not. It's, it's harder to really relate to a whole person and get to know a whole person, to bring up conversations that aren't about the work to find things in common that are completely unrelated. I know Management 3.0 has some tools for this. It can happen informally on smaller teams with different kinds of interaction. But I mean, we all present different faces to the world in the physical spaces, but particularly in the online space, we might be very different people at work or on Facebook or in a local group or, and that can happen that you end up with a quite a superficial knowledge of somebody and actually what counts if you are trying to solve problems or resolve conflict or something further down the line is knowing that whole person. And that, that doesn't always come easily in the online space. It takes quite a, a lot of time and a lot of quite deliberate attention and effort, I think, to really get to know people well. Yeah, it's about uh, spending time together. And Pilar? Yes, I'm going to add something. So something I've been talking to uh, recently with uh, Teresa Sigilito Holema. Uh, she's an intercultural global team, global virtual team specialist. So it also when you're building the team or building the team, actually strengthening the team, team development, team strengthening, I prefer that to team building, um, you it's not just about those relationships. That's what we need to focus in the online world because it'll get forgotten, if not. But it's also how we structure the work. And Teresa talks about interdependent tasks, that if we can do that within the team to get people to be working together as much as possible. And um, of course, if we are working in, with different schedules or in different time zones, that can be difficult. So then what else can we do in the team? That is that gets us to work interdependently, and for that I always remember when I was still working with Happy Melly that, for example, I didn't work at all with uh, Yoris and Sam, and so yeah, we were part of this twelve-person team or task force <laughs> a driving organization, but I rarely got to work with them. So we we worked together on a feedback process for the team. Mm -hmm. And that got us to strengthen a little bit more. And then if, we, if I'd stayed longer, I'm sure I would have worked with them at some point and already we would have experienced that working together. So I think let's not just think about 
things that are um, as well as our day-to-day -day tasks that we can do to get stronger, but let's think about how we can structure the work mm. to help us strengthen those relationships too. Love it. These are all really great things to be thinking about. That's why you should get their book. Again, it's called Thinking Remote, Inspiration for Leaders of Distributed Teams. And uh, I've got one more question, uh, but I'm trying to look at my notes. Oh, this is a, it's kind of a very, oh, travel tips. This was, okay, that's what I wrote. It's very, I did this like late last night as I was writing my notes and I can tell it's because my handwriting. <laughs> so the last chapter, it's called Remote Work, Anytime, any place, Anywhere. And so I have to just say what I find personally funny about that is, um, so my book, of course, is called Work Together Anywhere. And my husband, Florian, always makes fun of me. And he said, your book should be called Work Together Any Place, Any Time, All the Time, Everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so when I saw this chapter, I'm like, yeah, work together any time, any place, anywhere. <laughs> sorry for interjecting my personal side. <laughs> but in that chapter, you have a bunch of, I wrote down here, travel types. Travel types. Does, is that ringing a bell? Um, well, I, that was the chapter that I wrote, and it had some slightly tongue-in-cheek reflections about the assumptions that we can do all our work anytime, any place, <laughs> anywhere. Um, and what I found by testing that to destruction was that some kinds of work are very well suited to being done on your phone whilst running for a train um, or, or held up somewhere or trying to respond to a deadline when you're not in your traditional work environment. And obviously some kinds of work, as I really should have known, are definitely not best done under those circumstances. So the chapter was really about, yes, it's wonderful to have this flexibility. Yes, you can respond to changes and situations outside your control, like travel delays or problems, but actually, in an ideal world, you're going to really try and plan a little bit more proactively. So you're not trying to edit copy on your phone whilst traveling um, or trying to do interviews with people whilst you're in a shared space and all sorts of things that last summer I had a very complicated domestic routine going on and things I had to get done. I also had lots of work I wanted to do. And then there were emergent events that, oh, I'm going to be there. I can do this. And basically massively overscheduled and nearly got myself into an epic mess um, and created a lot of stress, not just for me, but for people around me and trying to do that. So it was some interesting lessons learned about how to work while traveling. I really admire people who literally can do all of their work anytime, any place, anywhere. Um, it was self-education for me that if I'm going to write and create and concentrate, I do have certain conditions in my environment that I can recreate in different places, but I certainly need a certain amount of silence and concentration and so on. So the idea of this sort of digital nomad sitting on the beach um, under a palm tree with your mat or whatever, um, it doesn't work for me. I know what I need. Uh, <laughs> I know where to find it. And I love the freedom and flexibility to be able to create my work around those circumstances with as, as much discretion as possible. And that's the only thing that kept me sane last summer was I could choose to a certain extent what to do where. Yeah, indeed. I, I myself have a lot of trouble of getting certain kinds of work done while I'm traveling. I can't focus. I get frazzled. I'm overwhelmed mm -hmm. easily. And then when there's, you know, travel stuff in the mix, it just sort of makes things uh, chaotic. And uh, I end up starting every email with apologies for the delayed response. It's like a macro <laughs> on my keyboard at the moment, you know, <laughs> and at some point I'm just like, screw it. I'm not apologizing anymore. It's busy. I can't, you know, I don't know how people do it. I just, I just can't, but really good reminder for if you're going to work in various places. I mean, I think we even talked about this on the, the work holiday. I think that was our first one on the virtual not distant podcast years, years ago. <laughs> on the work holiday that you do have to take into account, like um, is, you, is the work that you need to do, is it private or can you do it in a public mm -hmm. space? Um, does it need to be a closed space or open space? Temperature, lighting, you know, like internet, can, all these weird things that happen when you're on the road that you don't always have control over and then yeah. really planning your work. And you've spent years optimizing at home because you do video from your home office so you know exactly where your light is and everything else and all of that you've got it right and then you go to work at somebody else's house it's oh yes the internet's great and <laughs> well yeah, I can't, <laughs> so bad or, yeah. I can't use this uh, uh, yeah it's it, 
where we know what we're used to and we might have taken quite a while getting that set up right for us. Um, and there's a whole load of assumptions baked into that that don't necessarily come in every remote space. They don't even come in every co-working. Uh, I went to a co-working in the summer that had really horrible seating. I thought, no way, I could sit and write here for a day. Um, this is really unergonomic and I don't know if I've just got a weird shaped body, but it, it didn't work for me. So I wanted to be home with my nice comfy chair. I think also it's going back to the kind of work we're doing uh, and even so what kind of work can we do? Mm. So for example, when I go on a plane, I read. That's what I do. If I'm going to do any kind of work on a plane, I'm going to read because I can't physically sit with my laptop or, or anything. Um, and it, it, it goes back. I came across a concept some time ago. Let me see if I remember the four different kinds of work that require four different states, four Cs, contemplation, concentration, collaboration, and one other one that I can't remember. <laughs> concentration, contemplation. Communication. Communication, consumption. probably communication. Sorry, Amaya? Was it consumption? Because no, we were saying about really, reading. Yeah. We need more Cs. <laughs> we have five Cs now. We yeah. like one C. <laughs> yeah. um, and these were more applied to teamwork, which actually goes back to right at the very beginning of this conversation about designing the online space, is mm -hmm. we need different things for different uh, types of work. So sometimes it might be worth thinking about that. Okay, if I'm traveling, what are the kind of tasks that require, for example, concentration? Well, maybe I don't want to do this. Or maybe I do, because actually on a plane, I can concentrate more than I can. So, and, and knowing your personal preferences is very important. Yeah, it's interesting. I know a lot of people talk about how they really like travel to get concentrated work done. Um, maybe slightly less so now that it's becoming more common to have Wi-Fi access in flight. But before, it might have been a time where you could literally just switch off for six hours and have no email. So, yeah, people would use that time to write or study or something. Whereas I, t I tend to, well, I tend to take shorter flights and I do think of it as time to read. I just, you know, I might be able to make notes and highlights on my Kindle or something if it's if it's business reading but I think of it as time to consume information rather than try and create anything new it's a different sort of concentration and it is just that self-knowledge combined with an understanding of the work and putting that together with the circumstances and that's what real flexibility is and if, if people can take that take responsibility for that it's incredibly liberating but it's a very different way to which most of the world works and making that transition is huge and we can easily take for granted that, oh yes, you know, home working, everyone will just adjust to that and people can work where, where they work best and everyone will be happy. But mm -hmm. discovering where you do what kind of work best when and under what circumstances is a complex journey. Um, I've been on it for nearly two decades now and I don't feel I've got it nailed at all <laughs> there are still things that can throw me like a family holiday last month where I literally had one bar of 3g to work with I took my laptop I'm like you know complete waste of time <laughs> I should have just said right I'm gonna unplug completely mm. um but they oh yeah yeah there's internet yeah yeah I'm sure there is um, <laughs> and that was in the UK <laughs> Indeed, I think that's a that's a really good way to wrap up. It's a, it's a combination of self knowledge, the kind of work that you have to do, and the location where you do it best. Um, and I think that your book, the book that you guys have written in particular, gives people a lot of really good things to think about that you would not have normally thought about when leading a remote team or leading working with remote colleagues. Um, so really, really well done. I hope people. Uh, people will get a copy. Again, it's called Thinking Remote, Inspiration for Leaders of Distributed Teams. And Pilar and Maya, where can you get this book? Um, anywhere. Book <laughs> um, Anytime, like, anywhere. <laughs> from our website, virtualnotdistant.com, there's a big um, menu tab at the top saying books, and that's got a link to all the different online stores. You can get it um, from a well-known bookstore in paperback format. It's available if you prefer to have something to literally make notes on <laughs> as you go in, in physical form, but it's available on all, loads of different platforms. So it's been a learning journey for me um, that Pilar knew much better that process of self-publishing and we tried to make it as widely available as possible so people can have it how they like. And there's an audio version coming soon. Ooh, awesome. Totally awesome. So unless you're living in a cave somewhere, you should be able to find this book. 
Um, and if you're living in a cave, you're probably not listening to this podcast. So, uh, so unless circumstances are totally weird, you should be able to find this book. I'll be linking to it in the show notes. But Pilar and Maya, it is so good to talk with you both again. Thank you for taking the time to be here today and for talking about your book. Uh, the questions I had did not give it justice. I think that everybody should pick up a copy, especially if you're leading a virtual team. So thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. All right, everybody. Until next time, be powerful.